chapter 10. So as I told you before, uh, we're looking at agency law now and sole proprietorship and partnership, uh, business organizations will um, discuss about uh, next week, along with corporations on chapter 11. So I estimate this chapter maybe a bit shorter uh, for this evening. So let's uh, talk about uh, agency law. And throughout the lecture, I hope um, you can realize why agency law is important. So you may know uh, travel agents, insurance agents, um, real estate agents, uh, realtor, so selling real estate agent, purchasing real estate agent, so this is all agency law. There's always an agency relationship. And what is this relationship? Well, in law, this relationship involves three parties. So there's the agent. The agent is working for what we call the principal. But the agent is working for the principal dealing with a third party. So let me give you this um, car insurance example. The ICBC agent is working for ICBC, dealing with us, the insured, the client. The travel agent is working for Air Canada, for um, any resort or any travel uh, company. Dealing with the clients, selling vacation packages, selling air tickets, etc. And this uh, triangle relationship, triangular relationship, is always composed by the principal being the company or person uh, who the agent works for, and the third party who the agent uh, deals with. Uh, I'm not sure you've been to uh, Metropolis, Metro Town uh, already, uh, but when you go there, sometimes there are um, employees from TELUS or Shaw, they are offering TV services, internet services. So those are agents, they are employees, but they are also agents because they are working for either TELUS or Shaw, dealing with clients, with third parties. So I've given you several examples about this agency relationship. And it is important that we remember that the principal is vicariously liable for the agent's acts. So if the agent acts within their authority, within their power, but cause damages, losses to third parties, the third party may sue both the agent or and or the principal. Okay? So that's a protection for uh, the victim, for the third party. And vicarious liability uh, you saw for the first time in Chapter 5. So moving on. Well, an agency relationship will be created by granting authority. So the principal grants authority to the agent. When uh, ICBC hires the agent in their agreement, they grant authority, they give authority to the agent to sell car insurance, truck insurance, uh, and any other types of insurances they can sell. So this is how an agency relationship is created. And in most cases, it is created by a contract, by an agreement. And in best, the best scenario is when this re, uh, agency relationship is created by a written agreement. But there are situations in which this authority is granted by uh, orally or by conduct, this is also valid. 
So I'll give you some examples um, in a minute. When uh, an agency relationship is created by contract, the best uh, procedure or the, the good practice would be by written agreement and it will be a contract as we just saw. We just studied contract law. But now it is a contract is specifically for an agency relationship. So in this contract, there will be a description of who the principal is, who the agent is, uh, what authority the agent has, uh, what are the duties, uh, how the agent will be paid, etc. Uh, for example, uh, I may be um, Apple. Apple, they may have several purchasing agents in Asian countries. So Apple may be sourcing out parts or full products in Asia through uh, purchasing agents. So those agents, they are working for Apple, dealing with third parties, with suppliers. So Apple, in those agreements, Apple could, could and should detail the extent of their authority. So the agents could only purchase up to 1 million, up to half a million, up to 10 million. Well, this is... Uh, detailing the extent of the authority of the agent. Because if the agent goes beyond authority, over authority, we just studied this, it will be breach of contract because the agent would not be performing as agreed. So Apple has given authority to one of their purchasing agents to buy up to 1 million and they ended up purchasing 2 million of products. So the agent went beyond their authority. In this case, if the third party has uh, losses or damages, they would sue the agent because the agent misrepresented. The agent committed to a 2 million purchase, but they didn't have power. They didn't have authority to commit to such a uh, purchase, okay? A power of attorney. This is when one person gives authority to another to uh, act on their behalf. So this is also an agency of uh, relationship. So for example, in my case, I'm from Brazil. I have some, I still have some issues in Brazil. I have some property in Brazil. So I have, given power of attorney to my sister so she can deal with issues on my behalf. So she can talk to my bank manager if I need. She can uh, solve some uh, issues with my land or property. So this is an agency relationship as well. It's not for purchasing. It's not for business. But it is one person acting on behalf of another with third parties. Okay? Let's say you have any, you have a property, a land in Manitoba, but you live in BC. So you may give a power of attorney to someone you know in Manitoba. They live there so that they can speak with authorities. They can solve any problems to you in case uh, you can't be there. Okay. Uh, when authority is given, authority is granted to the agent by the principal, this authority may be the actual authority or this may be what is called apparent authority. So we have two types of authority. One is the actual authority. The actual authority is the one that is specifically given. So I've given authority to my sister in Brazil to deal with my uh, house issues with my bank issues so that's the authority she has she doesn't have authority for other things on my behalf only for those two for example so that's the actual authority the uh, details or the detailed authority that is uh, granted to the agent and again if the agent exceeds the actual authority as in the apple example i've given you uh, before the 2 million purchase, 
exceeding the 1 million uh, purchase authority, then the agent is liable. I am, uh, the principal is not liable, but it is the agent that is liable. Whereas apparent authority, what is apparent authority? It is when the principal, so let's say, uh, tell us, when the principal, tell us, acts in a way to make the third party believe. So who is the third party? The client. So the client believes because the principal was acting in a way that the agent has authority to act. Well, I'm at Metropolis Metro Town. I see, uh, I see uh, employees of Telus or Shaw, and I purchase internet service from them. I purchase TV services from them. Well, I don't know if they are employees, if they have agreements. I don't know what authority they have. But because they have business cards, because they are wearing Telus or Shaw, that the company T-shirts, logo T-shirts, etc. So it is the principle acting in a way that I believe the agent has authority. Or a simpler example, uh, a salesperson in a store. When you go to Apple store, when you go to Microsoft store, when you speak with a salesperson, an employee, they have the uh, company T-shirt, they have a tag, and they give you instructions, details about products. You don't know if they have actual authority or not. But the fact is that the company is acting in a way that you believe the agent has authority, the employee has authority. So whenever this is called apparent authority. And this apparent authority is very important because the principal cannot deny the transaction. So let's say um, the Telos example. And um, I'm going to get the uh, power of attorney question in a minute. I'm going to answer this in a minute. I'll just uh, finish this example. So let's say you purchase internet connection, uh, internet service from a TELUS uh, agent. And then they would come the following day. They didn't come. You call them and they say, no, I have no records of your uh, purchasing internet services. But then you have a copy of the agreement you signed. You have a um, business card from the employee. So this is a real example of a apparent authority because you didn't see the agreement for actual authority. And TELUS cannot deny that transaction. They cannot say, no, no, you have not purchased internet services. They have to uh, deliver the services to you. Okay, So that's why... Uh, apparent authority is very important. We also say this is um, agency formed by Stopel. Um, but if you memorize this or if you learn this by apparent authority, um, it's technically uh, better. So the question is, what is the length of time for the power of attorney? Well, it's up to the person who uh, grants the authority. So I have granted authority to my daughter uh, for indefinite period of time. And when it is for indefinite period of time, it means it is valid until I pass away or until I uh, revoke, until I cancel in writing that power of attorney. But it could be the case that you can issue a power of attorney for one month, for one year, for some years. So it depends on who is issuing. If you want to set the time, the length of time, you have to make it explicit and detailed in the power of attorney. This power of attorney is valid up to December 31st, 2020, for example. Or this is valid for an indefinite period of time. Okay? All right, so apparent authority is there. Uh, there also, there may be uh, agency relationship by ratification. See, I'm talking about ratification, R-A, A-S-A-P-R-I-O. Um, in contract law, 
I discussed about rectification, R-E. This is a different thing. Ratify means confirm, confirmation. So agency relationship can also be formed by ratification. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say I am selling my house. Uh, I don't have a selling agent yet. I should have, but I don't have yet. So someone, a selling agent uh, that I haven't appointed yet, but a selling agent became aware I'm selling my house and offers my house to someone else. And this someone else is interested in my house. But the agent doesn't have my authority yet. So after the situation... I can ratify, I can confirm a contract. So let's say the selling agent actually sold my house. And I can confirm, yes, I'm interested, so I can sell. But it depends on me. I need to confirm, I need to ratify. This is one example. Or another example, when the agent goes beyond authority. So the example I gave you, the um, purchasing agent for Apple, they had 1 million uh, uh, purchase authority, but they, the agent purchased 2 million worth of products. And Apple is actually interested in the 2 million purchase for whatever reasons, but they are interested. So even though the agent has gone beyond authority, Apple is able to ratify, to confirm. They don't need to, but if they want, if they uh, are interested in, they can ratify. And here I'm saying inadvertent ratification. So it may also be the case, let me use the same example of the 2 million purchase. So the agent purchased 2 million, products were shipped to Apple in California, products were unloaded and were further distributed to Apple stores. So by accepting the products, even though the agent had gone beyond their authority of 1 million because Apple actually accepted the products, sold the products, so they have ratified the agent's uh, conduct in an inadvertent way, not intentionally, but by conduct. So by conduct, you can also uh, confirm you can also ratify an agency relationship. And the last one is um, an agency relationship can also be formed by necessity. And this is very rare nowadays because, because of the technology, technological means of communication. But let me give you this example. Um, there's this truck full of uh, American lettuce going to uh, Calgary, and there's a heavy uh, snowfall, roads are blocked, and they will be blocked for one week. So the truck driver becomes an agent by necessity. The truck driver is now able to sell the letters to the neighboring uh, cities or places or villages, trying to avoid deterioration of goods, trying to preserve the value. Well, the truck driver was not the owner of the goods. The truck driver was not the agent of the owner of uh, the American letters. But by necessity, this was created. But again, this is rare because in this case, um, the truck driver would call the uh, owner of the letters, would get instructions, so would most, mostly, uh, most probably get clear instructions, clear authority. Uh, but it's an example. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna have you think for two minutes. No, not two, sorry. Three minutes here. What are the legal obligations of the manager in these circumstances? Who has the right? Who has a right? And what right? Does the client have a right in here? 
No. Does the manager have a right? Read it all and uh, let me know, please. What do you think? I'm showing you the um, my notes in here. My bad. Okay, so uh, let me discuss this with you. So John was a salesman, a new employee. Uh, he was in his first day and he was in charge of the store because the manager had gone to lunch. And the manager specifically told him to not to sell anything over 50. And while they were at lunch, the customer came in and purchased a TV. The price was 2600 And John sold with a 400 discount. So it means John did not uh, comply with the instructions of the manager. In other words, John went... Uh, beyond their authority. So John sold uh, with discount. The customer returned the next day to pick up the goods and the manager refused to go through with the deal. Well, this is a real case of apparent authority because the third party believed John had authority. And in this case, the manager cannot de deny the deal. In this case, the manager has to deliver the um, TV. How could the manager um, have made his instructions to be legally binding? The only way would be if the manager had put a disclaimer in the store, in a place where clients could see. Or John could have a tag, a big tag saying, uh, first day cannot sell over $50. That's it. But then you could ask, well, but uh, he, the manager did tell John about this. Okay, but the manager told only John. So this was only binding on John, not on third parties. Third parties were not aware about the actual authority. Third parties, they were aware about the apparent authority because John was by himself at the store and John actually offered a $400 uh, discount. So they believed John had all the authority to do this. So the only way would be a big disclaimer in the store uh, or at the entrance of the store or even uh, at the cashier saying uh, during lunch, uh, John cannot sell anything over $50. So even though John had offered the 400 discount for a 2600 uh, TV, before paying, uh, the customer would have seen that John did not have authority for that. Then in this case, the manager would be in a legal position to hold uh, the TV. Okay, is this clear? Uh, what is the consequence of John exceeding his authority? Well, um, 
this would be because there's an employment relationship uh, employment law would also uh, be relevant in here and the company would have only the remedy the store would have only the remedy to sue john uh, a, an employer cannot deduct any money from uh, the employee's uh, salary or wage uh, for losses that were caused by the employee. So the only remedy would be to sue John uh, or to give a verbal warning, written, written warning, or eventually fire uh, John. So those, those could be the consequences. Uh, but again, employment law would also be relevant uh, to solve this issue. Okay. All right, so let's move on. So duties here. Um, this is an interesting part uh, for you to pay attention because the agent's duties are the same as the ones of the partners. So next week, I'll tell you that partners in a partnership, they are agents of one another. Because they are agents of one another, the agent's duties apply to partnerships as well. So if you know them now, you don't need to know them again for uh, partnerships. So what are the duties for agents? Well, as with all contracts, parties they have to comply with the terms of the contract so here the agent has to comply with the terms of the agency agreement and on the top of that just emphasizing and reiterating what i told you already so the agent will be liable if they go beyond authority and then in this case the agent could be sued for breach of contract and the agent has to perform everything that is in the agreement. The agent also owes a duty of care to the principal. So they have to act in the best interest of the principal. They cannot go against uh, instructions of the principal. But then you can ask me, well, but John just went against the instructions from the manager. And you are now telling me that they cannot go. Yes, I'm telling you, they cannot. And if they do, there will be consequences. They may be sued if they cause damages. In that case, the employee could be dismissed for just cause. So there will be consequences if um, it happens. Agents cannot delegate responsibility without consent. So an agent who wants to delegate uh, responsibility to someone else could be permanently or temporarily. They can only do so if they have consent from the principal, okay? There's also fiduciary duty in here. And what is fiduciary duty? Fiduciary duty is a duty based on trust. Uh, clients and professionals, they are also involved in a fiduciary duty relationship. You saw this in chapter five. And agents and principal, principals, they are also in a fiduciary uh, duty relationship, okay? So there's a trust relationship here. Um, the agent, because of the fiduciary duty, uh, the agent cannot disclose uh, confidential information to third parties. Uh, the agent has to turn money to the principal. So if the agent um, gets money from third parties related to the transaction between the principal and the third party, they must turn over the money to the principal. They can only keep uh, what is um, related to their services, their commission or whatever they get paid um, to, but they cannot keep the money for uh, the main contract. Uh, also, the agent has this positive duty to disclose things. So if the agent is aware of anything, that may affect the business of the principal, the agent has to disclose to the principal. This is a positive duty. Silence in this case 
uh, of the agent uh, would be a breach of this uh, positive duty. And the agent cannot act for the principal and the third party at the same time unless both parties are aware and both parties have consented to. So if both parties have consented to this and are aware, then it's okay. The agent cannot profit at the principal's expense. So the agent goes to this trade show uh, and then they decide to extend their stay. There's this trade show in Las Vegas. The agent goes to the trade show because the principal wants them to go. But then they decide to extend their stay on the principal's expense. This is um, this is not legal. This <clears throat> is against. The agent cannot compete with the principal. Uh, that's why uh, the law changed here in BC. So from two years ago, um, whenever you are selling or buying real estate, house, land, apartment, townhouse, there has to be two agents. There has to be a selling agent and a purchasing agent. So one working for the seller, the other for the buyer. Before uh, both seller and buyer, they sometimes they had only one agent, so they saved some money. But nowadays, this is not possible anymore. And this is basically because agency law says the agent cannot compete with the principal. And sellers and buyers, they have competing interests. Uh, so that's an example here. Uh, fiduciary duty also, as I said, for professionals and clients, lawyers. Um, lawyers, they are acting as agents, as professionals, but also agents for their clients in court, negotiating with clients, etc. So there's a fiduciary duty here. Uh, as well. Uh, the law says the federal government owes a fiduciary duty to indigenous peoples and as um, how can I put this but uh, it's been more and more frequent uh, the recognition of indigenous peoples rights self-government and also this um, fiduciary duty that is recognized from the federal government to uh, to them, to indigenous people. So that's also um, important to know and to remember. So those are the duties for the agents. You can see agents have a lot of duties. That's why they have to be uh, well paid. Whereas the principal's duties, they are mainly owner in terms of contract, well, this is obvious. All parties to a contract, they have to own the terms of the contract. But the principal also has to pay a reasonable amount for the services and reimburse uh, any reasonable uh, work-related expenses. Okay? Uh, in the agency contract, if there are any ambiguities, if there are any misunderstanding, courts, they will mostly favor uh, a broader agent's authority in most cases. So in this, this is a real example in which courts, they favor the weakest party. Agents are weaker if compared to the principal. So courts, in case of ambiguities, in case of misunderstandings, uh, courts will favor uh, the agents, a broader authority for agents. Uh, liability. Well, as I said, the third party can sue the agent only when the agent goes beyond authority. If the agent doesn't go beyond authority, then uh, the principal is vicarious liable. So the third party is better off suing the principal. The principal is usually richer. Okay. Uh, vicarious liability, what I just said. So Principles then could be employers, could be companies. When they are acting as principles, they are vicarious liable. If the uh, agent 
acts within authority but acts um, <coughs> causing damages or losses. And again, vicarious liability is important for the victim. So it is a protection for the victim. Let's say an employee causes damage uh, to your car uh, in the car wash, for example. Um, it's common that the employee cannot afford to uh, pay damages for the damages they cause, for the losses they caused you. So in this case, you could sue both the agent, the employee, and the employer, and the corporation, and the company, and the car wash. You will not recover from both. You will recover from either one or the other. But in most cases, it is the employer, it is the company that can afford to pay the damages, not the employee. And by the way, in most cases, companies, they carry liability insurance. So they will claim uh, on their insurance to pay uh, compensation. <clears throat> Uh, how does an agency relationship end? Well, it ends when the contract says, as I said in the question for uh, the length of power of attorney, if the power of attorney says it ends in one year or at a certain date, so at that date it will end. And it is the same for an agency uh, agreement. Or it may also end if the principal dies or becomes insane or bankrupt so the agency relationship will end uh, automatically okay question for you here related to agents duties Which one is true here? D, that's correct. D has done it. The agent must always account for monies coming to their hands on behalf of their principal and then turn over the, turn over the money. All other statements are wrong. They are not true. So a real estate agent may buy property from a third party at a good price and then sell the property to their principal. No, no, no. They would be taking advantage. This is not correct. B, an agent is not entitled, is not entitled to degree upon commission and reasonable expenses. No, yes, they are. C, an agent cannot act for two principals. Even with the knowledge. So if there's knowledge and consent, the agent can. Sorry here. So the agent cannot act without the knowledge and consent. But with the knowledge and consent, they can. That's why this is not correct. Okay? D is the correct one, and E, an agent need not disclose all relevant information. No, they, they do need. And then actually, they have this positive duty to disclose information. Uh, was it clear was, uh, why C is not correct? Yes, they can. They can 
when there's knowledge and consent. So there has to be knowledge and consent. So let's say um, I work for uh, TELUS, and I'm an agent or employee of TELUS, and then I, uh, Shaw is interested in, uh, in my working for them. So I need to disclose this to both TELUS and Shaw, that I will be working for both, and both of them have to consent. So if both of them have knowledge and consent, then I can. But without knowledge and or consent, no, agents cannot. Okay? All right, so enduring power, uh, power of attorney, what is this? So this is granting power of attorney. The same example I gave you, I granted a power of attorney to my sister in Brazil. But the fact that this is an enduring power of attorney, it means that even if I lose capacity, if I become um, insane, if uh, not I, but let's say if the person who issued the power of attorney develop some uh, mental illness, uh, they cannot act well with their finances or take decisions. With an enduring power of attorney, the person with uh, power, with authority, can act on behalf of that person. So this is um, a lot used by elderly people or as people become older and older, they may want to issue enduring power of attorney to their children or to someone who is younger and of their trust in case they lose their capacity, but they still need to make financial decisions or healthcare decisions. Uh, so this person of trust will take those decisions, will make those decisions to them. So that's an enduring power of attorney. It's not a, it's not a normal power of attorney. It's a different one because it functions, it works well uh, for um, lost uh, of capacity, okay? So now, types of business organizations. I will stop here.